title of our sermon this morning is Redemption Determined. Redemption Determined. Now, welcome back to our study of the essentials. One sermon, one hour, one subject essential to a solid doctrinal foundation in the faith. Now, as we come to the topic this morning that we're going to be discussing, the covenant of redemption, that one sermon, one hour commitment is going to be put to the test. <laughs> Uh, over the next few weeks, we come to this subject of covenant theology or a study of the divine covenants. And covenant theology is a, a massive subject uh, impacting a wide range of issues cover to cover in the Bible from Genesis to, to Revelation, far-reaching implications. It's just a huge subject, a subject that we will spend uh, our lifetimes here and into eternity uh, thinking about and glorifying God for and praising Him for and worshiping Him for. Uh, it's just a massive subject. When you were in school, if you remember being back in school and maybe you were assigned a paper to write, uh, covering covenant theology in one sermon is a little bit like writing a geology paper on rocks. <laughs> uh, what's your astronomy paper going to be on? My astronomy paper is going to be on space. <laughs> it's, uh, if, if you had a good teacher, your teacher would come to you and say, listen, you need to narrow your subject. Narrow your subject, right? Uh, much to the consternation of a good teacher, uh, we're here doing the very same thing again. We're, we're covering a massive subject. We're attempting to introduce it to you. You got to begin somewhere, right? You eat a camel one bite at a time. You got to start with the first bite. So here we go. Uh, I've heard covenant theology compared to the framework of a building, the framework or the support structure of a building. When you look at most buildings, the framework is hidden from view, but it's there behind the walls, so to speak. It's there. As you look at key features of the building, you look at key features of the elevation, key features of the architecture, you can see that there were plans put in place. You know that there's an internal structure there supporting the whole behind the walls, so to speak, and that supporting structure, that framework is that on which the building or the features of the building are built. But generally, the framework or that support structure runs throughout the whole house. You're following the analogy, right? It runs throughout the whole house. There's continuity to that support structure throughout the whole house. It runs from room to room, so to speak. And as a good architect might study each room individual for individually for its characteristic features, he knows that there is a supporting framework that runs throughout. Covenant theology is not unlike the framework or that support structure in a building. It's a framework that Scripture gives us. This is a framework that Scripture gives us to better see, better understand, better appreciate the beauty and the continuity of the whole of God's revelation to man. God's revelation to man isn't merely a series of stories or sort of a connected series of narratives that are loosely put together, this sort of generally... Te it's not like that at all. Uh, scripture is a grand whole, a grand narrative made up of connected tissue, so to speak, that runs through the whole of Revelation from Genesis to Revelation. The rooms or the subjects, if you will, of Scripture aren't chopped up and freestanding. There's continuity. Rooms flow from one to another. There's a progress of revelation, you could say, from room to room. Rather than different dispensations with different peoples, with different programs, different purposes, different promises, what we find in Scripture is one progressively revealed purpose and one progressively revealed people. That's extremely important for us to understand. In Scripture, there is one progressively revealed purpose and one progressively revealed people. When we look at Scripture, I think you begin to see that, don't you? When you read your Bible, and you read your Bible, you read your Bible, you're studying your Bible, you think about it, all of this is the plan of God coming to fruition now in time. As we walk through each room of that building, that structure, or each subject in Scripture. And there are many, many rooms, right? Covenant theology is like the unifying framework or the unifying support structure that helps us to see the building as a whole. And it helps us to appreciate the building as a whole. We see more of the building, so to speak, because we understand, we know about that support structure. 
So I pray, and I hope I'll be praying with you, uh, that this brief introduction to covenant theology over the next several weeks will adequately open the front door, so to speak, (laughs) so that you and I can step through, stand in the foyer, and examine the grand beauty of this beginning of this subject. And I hope it's going to prompt you to further study as you walk through the house. As you walk through the house, it's a subject like this that helps inform our understanding of those many rooms, okay? Very important. The 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith introduces the concept of covenant theology in this way in chapter 7, beginning in Article 1. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to Him as their Creator, yet they could never have attained the reward of life but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which He hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. Again, the distance between God and the creature is so great because of our sin. And because we're creaturely. So God, the Creator, created man in His own image. But God is the Creator, and we are the creature. That in and of itself creates a great distinction between us and God. In that sense, God is entirely other from us. There is none like Him. Amen? But then on top of that, man has fallen. The chasm grew even greater because we've fallen into sin. And because that distance, that chasm between God and the creature is so great, there's nothing that we could do ourselves to have attained the reward of life. God, in His grace and His love toward us, condescends to redeem us, condescends to relate to us. And He has chosen to do that, pleased to express the revelation of Himself and His redemptive purposes in Christ by means of covenant. Now, covenant is simply a bond, an oath, you could say, a promise, but more than a promise. It's a binding agreement between two or more parties, an agreement, you could say. That agreement can be established in many ways, many ways in which that agreement, that covenant can be established, founded under various conditions. And although it may be established in many ways under various conditions, it's still understood as a covenant. Two parties may come together and negotiate a contract. That's a covenant. A conquering king may impose a tribute or a tax in exchange for future protection. That's a unilateral covenant, right? A man and a woman may commit themselves in covenant, the covenant of marriage, the bilateral covenant, right? Many conditions, many ways in which a covenant may be formed and still properly understood to be a covenant. Or a divine covenant may be imposed by God unilaterally with no input from man whatsoever, And all of these may be rightly described as a covenant. Hold your Bible up for a second. Even your Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, right? The word testament, the word testament merely translates or is another translation for covenant in the Bible. It's just another translation of the word for covenant. We have the Old Testament essentially corresponding to the covenant that God made, the old covenant that He made with the ancient nation of Israel at Sinai. And we have the New Testament corresponding to the new covenant essentially established by Christ uh, in His own shed blood with His new covenant people. So we have the Old Testament source documents, you could say. They are the covenant documents of that old covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. And we have New Testament or new covenant documents essentially related to His new covenant people in Christ. The actual Old Testament Hebrew word for covenant and the New Testament Greek word for covenant are used frequently, very often, very often in the Bible, all over the Bible. But it's also very frequent, exceedingly frequent, that covenant ideas and covenant language is being used without mentioning the actual word. When you begin to think this way, and you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you begin to see covenant influence, covenant ideas, covenant language all over the Scriptures. It's also very frequent, that, or understand, important to understand, that it's the context of that language that defines or orders the concept. We understand covenant 
and what kind of covenant it is or what import the covenant has based on the language in which it's found. Context is key, in other words. If you try to impose some needlessly strict definition of the word covenant, you're going to misunderstand your Bible and you're going to make a mess of a centuries-old conversation that we are now entering into, right? These are things that have been discussed among theologians for centuries. They've been talked about by Christian men, Christian women for centuries. And if you come along now and say, this is a covenant, and there is no other definition for a covenant, this is the way it's defined, and if it doesn't match this definition in Scripture, then it's not a covenant. And then you try to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say there's no, su- no such thing as covenant theology, you're going to misunderstand the Bible, you're going to miss out on your Bible, and you're going to make a dog's ear of the conversation that's been going on before you ever got there, right? You're going to make a mess of that room that you just walked into. Our confession and covenant theology in general is concerned with the study of the divine covenants. God has determined to be gracious to those that He has made in His image. But the distance between God and those He has made in His image, the distinction between them, the creature-creator distinction, so to speak, the chasm between them is so great that God must voluntarily or graciously, in love, He must condescend. God chooses to stoop, to relate to mankind. And the terms of that relationship are expressed by way or by means of covenant. They are relational arrangements. The divine covenants are relational arrangements. None greater than that covenant established in the blood of His own Son, whereby lost sinners deserving of hell may enter into life everlasting through faith in Him. The covenant of grace, right? Again, our confession. Chapter 7, article 2 says it this way. Moreover, man having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace wherein He freely offers to sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in Him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life His Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. I want to recommend our confession to you as we work through these subjects. It's exceedingly helpful. Nehemiah Cox, one of the leading contributors to our confession, said it this way, Divine covenants are concerned with the benefits of God that He will bestow on man, the communion that man will have with God, and the ways and means by which this will be enjoyed by man. Three aspects, right? They're concerned with the benefits that God is going to bestow on man, the communion that we'll have with God, and the means by which this will be enjoyed. Now, we see that expressed in the confession. Most importantly, we see it clearly expressed in the Bible, and most clearly and most beautifully expressed through the gospel. The gospel progressively revealed through the covenant of grace. Now, what we also see so clearly revealed in the Bible is that all this was far from being plan B or plan C when man fell into sin. Far from being God simply trying to salvage something left over after man fell in the garden, trying to figure it out as he goes along, right? Trying to make, oh, this is not going to work the way I thought it was going to work. We need to do something different. It's not what happened, right? Far from God sort of making this all up as he goes along, the covenant of grace is how God planned to glorify himself all along. If you consider these covenants and the way that God operates in Scripture, this was designed, you could say, in the infinite wisdom of Almighty God to bring about the most glory to Himself, the most glory to the Son, the most glory to the Spirit, and the most glory to those who will redeem in the Son. Uh, This is a beautiful, infinitely wise, immeasurably wise, perfect plan of God 
through which he saves his own. It is beautiful and magnificent and majestic and glorious. And the more that you learn of it, the more that you appreciate the beauty and the majesty and the infinite wisdom of it. The God who made us is the God who saved us and is the God who loved us before the foundation of the world and predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will before time began. All of this, everything that's taking place, took place first in the mind of an infinitely wise, infinitely loving, infinitely gracious, infinitely perfect God. And it is glorious. Chapter 7, Article 3. Listen to this. This covenant, in particular here, the covenant of grace, is revealed in the gospel. First of all, to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? Even in the midst of the curse, he says, your seed, the seed of the woman, will crush the serpent's head. A promise, the first promise of the gospel there in the garden. Afterwards, by farther steps, until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament, and it is founded in that eternal covenant transaction that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect. In other words, the story of the Bible is God's promise through the covenant of grace to redeem a fallen humanity in His Son. And that covenant of grace revealed in seed form in the promise to Adam, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And then you could say from Genesis to Revelation, from seed to fully bloomed, fully blossomed flower, from mystery to full revelation in Christ, we see that covenant established in technicolor splendor, if you will, through the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and session of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All that, all of that, our confession says, is founded in that eternal covenant transaction that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect. Our confession is referring there to the covenant of redemption. This covenant within the council of the Godhead is where it all began. It's Redundant to say eternity past, isn't it? <laughs> but eternity past sort of tells us which direction the eternity is reaching. It was, in a sense, in eternity past when this covenant, you could say this arrangement, was conceived within the councils of the Godhead. And this is where our discussion of covenant theology this morning will begin as well. In summary, let me give you a simple definition. A simple definition. The covenant of redemption is an agreement before time began between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to execute the will of God in bringing about the redemption of God's chosen or elect people. Let me give it to you again if you're writing it down. The covenant of redemption is an agreement before time began, an agreement between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to execute the will of God in bringing about the redemption of God's chosen or elect people. The covenant of redemption involves the ordaining or the appointing, the appointment of God the Son to accomplish the work of our redemption through His incarnation, through His perfect obedience, through His suffering, through His death, through His resurrection, through His ascension, and now through His intercession or session. The covenant of redemption also involves the work of the Spirit, empowering the Son in His incarnation and applying the work of redemption to the elect. In other words, the Father sends the Son, the Son accomplishes the work, and the Father and Son send the Spirit to apply that work to God's people. Make sense? All of that determined before time began. Everywhere in Scripture, this arrangement is spoken of in terms of or in the language of a covenant, what the Father will do for the Son, what the Son will do for the glory of the Father, how the Father and the Spirit will assist the Son, how the Spirit will apply the work. Now, like the word Trinity, like the word Trinity, you're not going to find that label, covenant of redemption, in the Bible. 
You're not going to find that label in the Bible. Like the doctrine of the Trinity, the covenant of redemption is a doctrine that is seen in texts, passages that refer to this arrangement that took place. Where you'll see this is in passages of Scripture where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are making commitments to one another. You see that in the language of the Bible, where God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are making commitments to one another to execute the work of redemption, where God promises reward, where God promises glory to the Son, and where those commitments are fulfilled. And I want to take some time today and look at some texts and some passages that will help us to see these things. Where there is covenant language being used, or the workings of a covenant being described, you'll see contracted parties, you'll see contracted commitments, and you'll see contracted rewards. Where covenant language is being used, you'll see contracted parties, contracted commitments, and contracted rewards. I want you to listen for those three factors as we take a look at Several texts this morning, beginning with the servant songs of Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42. I thought this would be a good section of text to take a look at these issues together. Isaiah, beginning in Isaiah chapter 42. And here in a section of Scripture about the coming or promised servant of God. They're called the servant songs of Isaiah. The beginning in chapter 42. There in chapter 42, begin in verse 1 with me. In verse 1, we have Yahweh speaking, God Almighty, okay? Chapter 42, verse 1. Yahweh says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. Now, from what we know of the rest of the Bible, and from what we know of Isaiah here in chapter 42, Who is God speaking of? Who's the servant? The servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4 will assert that he is the servant being spoken of in Isaiah. Okay, This is the servant of Yahweh. The servant of Yahweh is God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to what this servant will do. This is the work that the Son will accomplish. Verse 1, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. That's a work the Son comes to do, amen? And the Son gloriously accomplishes that work. Now, when was that work determined? Before time began. It wasn't that the alarm clock goes off, Jesus Christ hops up out of bed and He says, what am I going to do today? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring forth justice. No, right? That's not how it worked. This was determined before time began. Now listen, now it's time for Yahweh's commitments to support the servant in his work. Look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord God, Yahweh now, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. Now what will the Lord do now in sending the Son with this mission that we just heard about? Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Now, who is Yahweh making promises to here? Making promises to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh, God, is making promises, making commitments to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Flip the page and look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And look there beginning at verse 1. We have this mission that the Son has been set 
sent on by the Father and the Father's commitments to aid and to help the Son in His accomplishment of that mission. And now in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, the Son, God the Son, now speaks. Look at verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me. Who's the me? That's Jesus Christ. This is the servant speaking, right? The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, He has made mention of my name. And He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand, He has hidden me. He has made me a polished shaft. In His quiver, He has hidden me. Now listen, Jesus Christ is no created being. No created being. Being. But what has God, what has Yahweh done for the Lord Jesus Christ in His incarnation, in His sending of the Lord Jesus Christ into the earth to effect the work of our redemption, God has prepared Jesus Christ for this, right? Called Jesus Christ to this, you could say. He has said to me, verse 3, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain, yet surely my just reward is with the Lord. And notice the language now of reward, of reward for His work. And my work, my work with my God. Now, if you think about verse 4, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, was He received by those He came to? No. I came to my own They received me not. It looked like, especially at the Lord's crucifixion, it looked like His work was, you could say, in vain. There there weren't many saved. The elect had not been fully brought in. His work was only really beginning, right? His work was accomplished and finished at the cross and then continued by the Spirit through His people. But at that time, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord. He trusts the Father, you could say, with the accomplishment, with the finishing of the work that His reward is with Him. He will be rewarded for His labor. Uh, Elsewhere it says that His soul will be satisfied. He will look upon His work and His soul will be satisfied. And His work with His God. Verse 5, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be His servant, to bring Jacob back to Him, so that Israel is gathered to Him, For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, verse 6, It's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, to the nations. It's God the Father giving or sending God the Son as a light to the nations. Do you see? That, verse 6, you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to Him whom man despises, to Him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, that's the Lord Jesus Christ again, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. God the Father has chosen, so to speak, God the Son to accomplish this work of salvation. Thus says the Lord, verse 8, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. Here we're looking at covenant language, right? God sending the Son, God committing Himself to help and to aid the Son, the Son undertaking that work in covenant commitment to redeem His people. We're looking at Scripture where the members of the Trinity are making covenant commitments to one another, even language of reward associated with the fulfillment of those commitments. And again, when you begin to think of Scripture in these terms, you can think of passages all over the Bible where this is the case, right? All over the Bible where this is the case. I only do that which pleases Him, the Lord says, right? I've come to do the will of my Father in heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of Him who sent me, right? All over the Bible, this language. Flip the page and look at Isaiah 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Look there beginning in verse 4. 
And here in verse 4, God the Son speaking again. In verse 4, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as learned. Now remember, when we think about this in terms of the covenant of redemption, we're also um, very closely relating this subject to the Trinity. Right? The work of the Trinity. The members of the Godhead. God is one God in three distinct persons. They have one indivisible will as God, but they execute that one indivisible will as God in the economy or in the work of three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay, So here, you see this work of the Trinity, and again, all over the Bible. The Lord God has given me, so Yahweh has given God the Son The tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak, a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. We're seeing this relationship within the members of the Godhead. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and the servant here now replies, I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. In other words, that's God the Son saying, I was given a mission, and I didn't rebel against that mission. I was given a work to do, and I didn't rebel against that commitment. I didn't turn my ear away. I was not rebellious. Verse 6, what did he do? I gave my back to those who struck me. My cheeks I gave to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And elsewhere in Scripture, that obedience is beautifully exalted and magnified, isn't it? That he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, he has a name that is highly exalted, right? Why? Why did he do this? Why did the son commit to this mission? Verse 7, because the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Why? Because the Lord God will help me. You see these commitments made to one another, the work of each individual member of the Trinity. Verse 8, he is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Flip the page, Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And look there, beginning at verse 10. And specifically in Isaiah 53, notice the language of reward for his obedience. The language of reward. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Who put him to grief? The Lord did. Who did he put to grief? The Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord, the pleasure of Yahweh, shall prosper in his hand, right? It's the pleasure of Yahweh that is in the hand of God the Son, and the pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That work will prosper. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. Here are rewards for covenant fulfillment, right? Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And again, it's reminiscent of Philippians chapter 2. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. He he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow, Right? Reward for his labor. Flip the page. Look at Isaiah 61. Let's go to one more. Isaiah 61. All through the servant songs of Isaiah, we see this. And that's just a taste of this language 
all through the Bible. Isaiah chapter 60, it's, it's interesting. You'll talk to somebody and say, oh, it's nowhere in the Bible. Covenant redemption is nowhere in the Bible. Covenant redemption is all over the Bible. I was reading a book one time, and uh, I was sitting at the table reading a book, and uh, someone walked up to me, a pastor walked up to me, and he said, what you reading? And I said, I'm reading this book on the covenant of redemption. And he said, I'd believe that if it was in the Bible. <laughs> I'd believe it if it was in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible. We just need to see it. <laughs> we need to understand it, right? It's all over the Bible. Isaiah chapter 61, look there beginning at verse 1. Now notice the work of the Spirit in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Lord anointed the Son and anointed the Son with the Spirit. Now, to what purpose, to what end was the Lord, Jesus Christ, the servant, to what end was He appointed or anointed? Verse 1, to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me. Do you see the sent language, right? He has sent me. God the Father commissions God the Son. When did that happen? Before time began. What is that? That's the covenant arrangement determined before time began for our redemption. This is the covenant of redemption. To preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. Now Luke 4, in reading this very passage, the Lord Jesus Christ proclaims Himself to be this servant. Today, He said, right in the synagogue that day, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. He gives this message to the people. In other words, God the Father appointed and anointed God the Son as His divine messenger. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in His role as prophet. In His role as prophet, right? The threefold role, you could say, of the Lord Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ sent as prophet. You think about that with respect to Hebrews chapter 1. God, in various ways in times past, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but now in these last days has spoken to us by His Son, right? Jesus Christ comes as prophet, priest, and king. Not just comes, Jesus Christ sent by God the Father as prophet, priest, and king. Now think with me and let's summarize these passages. We've gone through several passages just in one book of the Bible. What do we see in these passages. And again, there are many like them. We see three parties to the covenant, three parties to this arrangement, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see three distinct roles or three distinct works, you could say, that are being done. Each member of the Trinity with work that they alone perform. God the Father does not die. God the Son dies on the cross, right? God the Son did not choose. God the Father chose. You see, three distinct. The, the Spirit of God is poured out after Jesus Christ ascends, right? God the Father isn't, wouldn't be accurate to say that He was poured out, okay? Three distinct roles, but a perfect economy of effort, a perfect economy of work. There's not one thing missing. Now listen, this is where good theology becomes very important. Jesus Christ didn't just make salvation potential for anyone who would come as if His blood was shed in vain, but God the Father elects a people for the Son. He gives or grants that people to the Son. The Son comes and He bears their sin sheds His blood to redeem those whom the Father has given Him. And the Spirit is applying the work, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ to the elect for their redemption. It is a perfect work. Do you see? Nothing, no effort wasted. No effort wasted. It's perfect. Three parties of the arrangement. Three distinct roles. We see covenant commitment. I will do this for you. 
You will do this for me. I will be rewarded for this work that I will accomplish, right? And we have agreeing parties. We have commitments, promises, requirements, rewards. This is all the language of covenant. And one example from a series of texts where we see specifically here the covenant of redemption. And we know from many texts in the Bible, think through some of these with me. We know from many texts in the Bible that this arrangement entails commitments. One, the Father sends the Son to complete a mission. Obvious from the text of Scripture. The Father sends the Son to complete a mission, the work of redemption. Even the name servant, right? The way that the Lord calls him his servant in the servant songs of Isaiah. In John chapter 5, verse 36, the Lord Jesus Christ says, the works which the Father has given me to finish. There are works that the Father has given him to finish. When did he give him those works to finish? Before time began, right? When? At the, in the councils of the Godhead, in the covenant of redemption. God the Father gives God the Son works to finish. John 5, 36, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And there it is again, sent language. And now, listen folks, you and I, we participate in the accomplishment of that work, which is a glorious and gracious privilege of God as He condescends to include the bride of Christ in making up what you could say, what Paul would say, was lacking in the afflictions of Christ to bring about the accomplishment of His work on the earth by preaching the gospel. We are included in this. As the Father sent me, Jesus Christ said, so send I you. <laughs> right? We participate in this, which is a glorious Glorious blessing. So one, the Father sends the Son to complete a mission. Two, the Father appoints the Son as prophet, priest, and king. The Father appoints the Son as prophet, priest, and king. Listen to this from Psalm 2, beginning in verse 6. God says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Was the Lord Jesus Christ begotten as son on the day that he was born to Mary? No, the Bible says that he was eternally begotten of the son, the eternally begotten one. He is, this is the eternal generation of the son. He is, when was the day, you could say, when God said, today I have begotten you? It's eternity past right? Eternity passed before time began. God says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. My king, prophet, priest, and king, God establishes the Lord Jesus Christ as king. Psalm 110, beginning in verse 1, listen. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. Notice the Lord has sworn. What is that? That's covenant language, right? Who did he swear to? He swore to God the Son. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who's that? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophet, priest, king. Listen to John chapter 10, verse 17. The Lord says, Therefore my Father loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. The son was a willing party to the covenant. Do you see? No one takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. 
Again, covenant language, agreement language. It's obvious, isn't it, from Scripture. There's an arrangement that has taken place between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity past that affects our redemption. Thirdly, the Father commits Himself to the Son. He gives His Spirit to the Son. He protects the Son, preserves the Son, loves the Son, sustains the Son. Fourthly, the Father promised reward for the Son in the accomplishment of His work. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 53, where God says to the Son, I will divide a portion for Him among the great. I will give Him, I'll divide Him a portion with the great. We also saw that in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him, right, given Him the name which is above every name. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And speaking of reward, look also at the end of the matter, you could say, in Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, and the reward given to the Son for the accomplishment of the work that the Father has given Him to do. Right? Revelation chapter 5, look at verse 8. And when He had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you, they're singing to God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Notice also who's involved in the reward given to the Son. Is that not awesome? (laughs) Right? Verse 11, Then I looked... And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And words cannot describe, right? Words fail us. But that's the reward given to the Son for the accomplishment of His work. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that is in them, are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped Him who lives forever and ever. Right? He is the preeminent, the supremely exalted one forever and forever. Why? Because He has accomplished the work that the Father has given Him to do in the redemption of His bride, us, His people. Right? Amazing. That is amazing. We see that the Lord, we see that, don't we, in the Lord's high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. On the eve of His crucifixion, listen to this from verse 1. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up His eyes to heaven and He said, Father, the hour has come. This is the hour of His death. He's about to go to the cross. He's going to drink the cup of God's wrath. Glorify Your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given Him authority over all flesh, to what end? That He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. Listen, this is (laughs) so clear, so inarguable. This is covenant language, commitment language. God the Father committed to God the Son. God the Son accomplishing the work that God the Father has given Him to do for Whose benefit? The elect's benefit. Those that God the Father has given to God the Son. When did that take place? Before time began. Do you see? You have given Him authority over all flesh that He, the Son, should give eternal life to everybody. No. To as many as you have given Him. And this is eternal life, verse 3. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. 
I have finished the work which you have given me to do. When was he given that work? Before time began. The covenant of redemption. You see? I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Well, after the Lord was crucified, I guess the covenanted work of redemption then was over. No, the accomplished work of our redemption is finished. The Lord Jesus Christ said, it is finished. But the work of gathering in now the elect and applying the blessings of that accomplished work rests in the power of the Spirit as He continues the work. We see the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, then applying the work of redemption. Acts chapter 2, verse 33, listen. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God... Jesus now, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, when did Jesus receive the promise of the Holy Spirit? In the councils of the Godhead before time began, right? <laughs> Same answer. He poured out this which you now see and hear, Peter says, at Pentecost. Covenant parties involved, covenant commitments made, covenant rewards promised, covenant rewards fulfilled, Notice the presence of prior promises, prior commitments. All this determined, again, before the world was. We're not making this up as we go along. Right? This predates Adam's sin, predates creation, predates any work that you think you could, should do. Predates you. Before, Romans 9, before the children had ever done anything good or evil, God said, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated, predates you, predates me. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, after we were born. No, it's not what it says. Before time began. You see? Before time began. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. We live in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised after we were born. No, promised before time began. Promised long before God created us. Long before the Bible was ever even written. When there was only the triune God. Now listen, if there was only the triune God, then who was the promise made to? You ever thought about that before? Titus chapter 1 verse 2, we live in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Well, before time began, the only one who existed was God. One God, three persons, who was the promise made to? Before time began, Owen says it was made to the Son of God for us. The Son of God on our behalf. God the Father promised God the Son for us. Promised God the Son and us in Him. You see? Us in Him. This is a glimpse back in the annals of eternity, eternity past, so to speak, a glimpse at the covenant of redemption. In Luke chapter 22, there's so many texts. They are all over the place, all over the place. Luke chapter 22, verse 28, the Lord says to His disciples, He says, You are those who have continued with Me in My trials. This is nearing the end of the Lord's life. You are those who have continued with Me in My trials, and I bestow, diatitheme, diatitheme, I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed, the atithemi, one upon me. Lord Jesus Christ looks at His disciples and He says, you've continued with me in my trials. And now, in the accomplishment of my finished work, I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed upon or granted to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That word, diatithemi, is a covenant word. It's covenant 
language related to diatheke, which is covenant language. When did God the Father grant or promise a kingdom to the Son? Before time began. Well, what was in all of this the covenant commitment then of the Son? What was the covenant commitment of the Son? Jesus said to the Father, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Will of Him who sent me. What was the Son committing to do in the covenant of redemption? Think with me now. The Son would commit to the incarnation. Before time began, in the councils of the Godhead, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son committed to the incarnation. He would take on the flesh of our existence and walk in our shoes, so to speak, assuming a body and a soul for our salvation. Listen to Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son. Who sent forth His Son? God. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. The incarnation. One commentator said, God became what we are so that we might become what we are not. <laughs> God becomes what we are, that we might become what we are not, namely righteous. <laughs> Paul, says it, Paul says it this way, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him, right? The Son would commit to the incarnation. Secondly, the Son would commit to assume the legal responsibility for those He came to save. He was accepting legal responsibility for the elect, for His people, fallen humanity, those He would save. False worldly religion doesn't deal with sin. You talk to someone in false worldly religion, any, any other religion, but the one true faith, Christianity of the Bible, right? And it's all some variation of dealing loosely or not at all with the problem, the real problem of our sinfulness. Sweep it under the rug, capriciously forgive over here and don't forgive over here. And I'm just going to wipe the slate clean over here. And we're just going to, all you got to do is just ask forgiveness. Just try to shape yourself up. Just do the best you can. We know we're all sinners. Just do the best. It doesn't deal with sin, right? The legal liability associated with sin. Where does that legal liability come from? Well, it comes as a a result, you could say, of God's holy and just law. The Son, in the covenant of redemption, commits to assume our legal liability. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Let's look at this text and we'll conclude. Hebrews chapter 7. The Son commits to assume the legal responsibility for those He came to save. Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse 20. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Listen, this arrangement made between God the Father and God the Son for God the Son to come as prophet, priest now, and king, he was not made priest without an oath. And who was the oath made by? It was made by the one who said, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Made by God, Yahweh. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. The new covenant. The new covenant. A surety is a guarantor. A surety is someone who stands legally in the place of another and guarantees payment of a debt or payment of a legal liability. Someone who stands in the place of another and says, I guarantee this will be satisfied on their behalf, on their behalf or for them. He's a surety. He's a 
legal representative, right? A surety takes legal responsibility for that person's debt. A surety takes legal responsibility for that person's liability, for what they owe. If you think about it, his elect, his people, those who are in faith, right? those who are in Christ through, by grace through faith, what debt do we owe? What debt do we have? What legal liability have you incurred before God Almighty? Here's what it is. You have broken God's law. You have incurred a debt. Why? Because God has called you to be holy. He created you to be holy as image bearers of God. To be righteous. And you have sinned against Him. You have broken His law. From the time that you were born in Adam, you were born with incurred debt, with incurred liability to the covenant made with Adam to obey God. And you, being born a sinner, have not obeyed God. You've broken His law and you are guilty. As guilty, you owe a debt to what? To God and God's justice and God's law, and God's holiness. You are guilty and you are legally liable for having broken His law. Not only are we guilty for past sin against Him, everything that you've done, every sin that you've committed up to this point, but you are legally liable. You owe Him perfect obedience from now going forward. We owe to God perfect obedience to His law. He created us. He's our Creator. From the time that you broke His law, you were indebted to the law. You became guilty under the law. You have legal liability to the law, to God's justice. This is not a case of just do the best you can, right? Or let's just sweep it under the rug. Or I can just ask Him for forgiveness, and that's what God does. God forgives me. No, the legal liability associated with your guilt has to be dealt with. If God is to be just, God is just. His law is holy, just, and good, and God will execute the penalty associated with the legal liability of the law. There is a law. There is a lawgiver. We have offended God with our sin. As sinners, we are legally liable to punishment for our sin. We owe the justice of God. We owe God the just payment due our sin and rebellion, which is death and eternal death, torment in hell, the second death. What does the Son do in the covenant of redemption? Before time began, the Son, within the counsels of the Godhead, commits Himself to stand in the place of those who would be indebted, legally liable for their offenses against God. He is the surety of a new, a better covenant. He stands in the place of His own and He takes their punishment. He takes responsibility for their guilt. He is the surety, and He says, that debt will be satisfied. That debt will be paid. That guilt will be removed. That law will be satisfied, all to the praise and glory of the just lawgiver. He guarantees the satisfaction of God's righteousness, right? He pays what they owe. He suffers And he dies paying what they owe. And he does for them what they cannot do themselves. He fulfills all righteousness. He perfectly obeys. He becomes our surety, our satisfaction, our mediator. Glorious, right? And then listen, what... What He has committed Himself to do for us, we no longer must attempt to do for ourselves. He's finished that. 
If the Lord Jesus Christ is your surety, if He satisfied those demands in your stead, if He has taken your penalty and He has fulfilled the demands of the law that in Adam you were required to fulfill, then there's no more work that you or I could ever imagine to do. It would be absurd and even blasphemous for us to think that I can add something to that with my own effort. That's why salvation is not by works. It is entirely by grace. How do you, how do you get that? How is that applied to you? You receive it. You receive it. You say, there's nothing I can do. I am bankrupt. I am destitute. I am legally liable to the penalty of the law. God would be right and just to send me to hell. It's what I deserve. Not only have I offended His justice, I've offended Him with my sin. I've incurred indebtedness to Him, but I can never keep the law perfectly. I can't do what He requires. I'm incapable. But Jesus Christ is all my hope and stay. Jesus Christ has. Jesus Christ has done what you cannot. So what do we do then? The Lord freely offers this grace in the gospel. We'll talk about this covenant soon. He freely offers this grace in the gospel that if you'll just trust Him, if you'll just receive it by faith, right? Trust Him by faith. The Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness. He's my hope. He's my surety, right? He's the one. He's my substitute. He's the one who stands in my stead. And you turn from your life of sin and rebellion. You cling to Him by faith. You just receive that free offer. By grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Believers, by grace, through faith, are made to partake of the work already accomplished on our behalf by Him. We don't work to become righteous. We're made righteous in Him. We're made righteous by that legal work that He does. Why do we work now then? We work precisely because we have been made righteous. We work because He has made us righteous, because we are free now to live for Him. Verse 23 in Hebrews 7, the writer goes on to say, There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but He, because He continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Our salvation determined by the work of the triune God before time began. God sent the Son because of the great love with which He loved us. The Son took up the work, the one who loved me and gave Himself for me. And the Spirit applies the work. To what end? Think with me again. To what end? To what end? To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Son. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 24. Listen. Then comes the end. Right? Then comes the end. When He delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, 
it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. And now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's the end of the matter, right? That's glorious. Right? Uh, 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 an amazing, like tremendous, glorious plan of redemption for God's people. But what of us? What of us? Our br- the bride, those who have been redeemed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, doesn't mention us specifically right there. What of us? What of the bride? The righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ won, He gives to His bride. That we ourselves are righteous as He is righteous. Glorious. The, the exalted state, listen, the exalted state that the Lord Jesus Christ now enjoys. The one who has a name above all names, right? The one who is exalted above all the exalted state that the Son now enjoys is the exalted state that we enjoy in Him because we are raised in Him and we are glorified in Him. That exalted state He shares with us how we are joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. His rewards are our rewards through Him. He is our covenant head by faith. He's our representative. God didn't simply choose us. He chose us in Him. He gives us, you could say, everything that He now owns. We are co-heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. You think about that for a moment. Uh, What unimaginable glory awaits the bride. Tremendous, right? Tremendous redemption. This is that which our triune God determined before time began for His glory. This is the covenant of redemption. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who made it so. Let's pray. Take a few moments and think about that. And pray to the Lord in gratitude for that. And um, after you've prayed silently, we'll pray together. Then you are dismissed. Father in heaven, All praise, honor, and glory be to your name forever and ever. We love you. We thank you for this great love with which you've loved us. This great triumphant display of immeasurable love and grace and mercy and compassion and kindness in our Savior, our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for the blessings of this wondrous covenant, how that is worked out in time. Thank you, Lord, for having made provision for our sin. And thank you for the joy of being ever before your face, worshiping you and praising you into eternity. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.